also, I would like to cordially invite you to my presentation of Building a Better Villain, presented by Captain Mike, which is me, in case that was not abundantly clear. Hi. Ah, two, cap two captains and a bunch of mics. Feel free to call me either, or both, or neither. Uh, I respond to all of them. Uh, I would like, uh, did, uh, was anybody here at my panel yesterday? Do I have any repeat customers? Thank you very much for coming on back. Yesterday I did Building a Better Hero. So if you came here wondering, ah, but how do I apply these same concepts but for character creation uh, from the player character side? That was yesterday. But if you see me around, feel free to ask because I will happily talk about gaming at basically the drop of a hat. In case, again, that wasn't abundantly clear. And also, just to mention ahead of time, uh, not only am I doing presentations in the past or in the present, but also in the Ghost of Christmas future, I am doing one in two hours, which is putting the character back, nope, using story arcs in role-playing games. <laughs> Darn it, I knew I was gonna mess that up, and I did. Uh, in about two hours, I'm going to be, uh, after the end of this session, I will be doing uh, using story arcs in role-playing games, which is using traditional narrative arcs and applying them to role-playing games. Why they are sometimes difficult to integrate, how you can integrate them, and times when perhaps it is better to let role-playing games follow their own natural patterns. Um, it's a fun time and a good chance to, uh, sh for me to show off all of the stuff I almost learned as an English major. Um, tomorrow, and of a special interest to this particular crowd, I will also be doing uh, Building a Better Villain 2, Building a Better Recurring Villain, where I will talk specifically about not, um, not how to construct the villain in the first place, but how to keep them coming back, how to make them not just a fantastic enemy for the time, but also how they can keep back, and I will also be uh, keep coming back to, to foil your heroes or to, to generally antagonize your protagonists. Um, and also I will get into some more depth of a couple of the things here. This class, <laughs> this presentation turned out to just have so much stuff, it needed two sessions. Um, but certainly I don't feel like don't feel like you have to go to the other one to get the value out of this. I don't save the punchline for the next for the next presentation. And then if that is not enough, Captain Mike, for you, um, after building a better recurring villain tomorrow at four at 8.30, 9.30, 8.30? At 8.30, thank you, my assistant Liz. Uh, at 8.30, I will be doing, putting the player, or so <laughs> putting the character back in non-player character, which is about um, just what it says on the tin, how to make non-player characters more active and vibrant, more of a, a, a tool to enhance the setting as opposed to just standard stock characters or just random quest givers who don't have their own kind of vibe. Uh, all right, so uh, enough with the needless self-promotion and on to the stuff that I'm already doing. So thank you very much for coming to Building a Better Villain. Uh, let's talk about my favorite subject, which is me. Uh, just in case you haven't heard of me before, and I suppose that is entirely reasonable, I am Captain Mike. Uh, Michael Clegg is my standard name. Uh, I started off gaming way back when uh, with Dungeons and Dragons, and so I, of course, have my classic six stats. Uh, I am a presenter. I am also a teacher. I realize that that must come as a tremendous shock, uh, but I am a teacher. I teach English, and indeed, I have a master's degree in writing. Um, I have 30-something years of role-playing. I recently had to update that. Not real thrilled, but uh, time and tide wait for no one, etc. Uh, yes, so... Uh, what I will be doing is I will be taking a lot of narrative concepts from my English major side and my English teacher side and applying them to gaming because that's what I love to do. And really, isn't role playing just uh, collaborative storytelling? We're taking these elements and bringing them all together. So why not apply the same logic from one to the other? Which may seem straightforward, but I got here first. Oh, this is, by the way, not a, a class on how to do amazing PowerPoints, so there is nothing fancy. So, the essentials of a villain. And by the way, when I say villain, I'm using that as sort of shorthand for antagonist. The forces that oppose the player characters, the forces that oppose the main characters. Um, I use villain because in most cases, the adventuring party of whatever kind of game that you're running uh, is going to be in some way heroic, even if they're maybe more on the neutral edge. But there's nothing to say that these things are not equally applicable to, say, a group of paladins that are opposing your horrible wandering murder hobos. 
how you apply these, it's the same thing. You can flip the script however you want, but protagonist, hero, antagonist, villain. Villain is just much easier to say, and it has kind of that cool ring because it's a word that starts with a V. So the essentials of a villain. Villains need motivation. This is sometimes undersold because oftentimes villains just get a very standard motivation. Uh, what is the dragon's motivation? He's hungry. What is the supervillain's motivation? He's angry. But to have a, a strong motivation and having a, a layered motivation can really work towards making a villain seem more like an individual, more like a person, and especially more like a person who might have taken a heroic path if not for some of their aspects of personality or some inst instances in their history. Uh, villains will also need, a, need to pose a credible threat. A villain that poses no threat and no actual block to the heroes is not really a villain, but more of sort of a billboard that they pass. Um, the blacksmith who won't take their gold coins because their gold coins are from the empire and he only trades in the gold coins from the local area and what do you know, there's a money lender right across the way that will exchange one for the other. Neither is a villain. That's not really a threat. That's not even really more than a minor inconvenience like having to go to the ATM. Uh, but a credible threat, even if it's not a violent threat, it might be something, might be a villain that opposes uh, the heroes in some sort of lawful way. Um, think of any movie, especially, this was especially common, I think, during the 80s, um, but the, the person who's like, you need the proper forms for whatever you're doing because I don't want you to do it, so I'm going to put as much red tape in your way as I can. That's a credible threat because if there's enough red tape, then the heroes have to choose between law and order or getting things done, and not every hero can answer that as quickly as the next. Uh, a connection between the heroes and the villain is possibly not an essential, but a great thing to have. And at the very least, a connection should be formed. That's what really makes a villain as opposed to just another bad guy. Uh, and ultimately, a villain has to be assailable or beatable. Uh, there has to be something that the heroes can manage to do that actually affects what the villain is doing. Even if it's not a way to necessarily, you know, kill the bad guy because that's such a standard sort of a thing. Well, how do you solve the problem? You put a sword in it until it stops being a problem. Um, but it has the, they have to be beatable in some way or at least seem to be able to, uh, it has to seem like it's possible to try. But before I get too far into all of this, uh, this slide, by the way, is one that you'll see quite often if you attend my other presentations because it is the best advice I can give to basically anyone who's trying to communicate, but especially people who are trying to tell a story with other people, and that is that you need to know your audience. And I feel that this is especially true when we're dealing with villains because if you as a game master aren't quite sure if your players are comfortable with the layers of villainy that can, uh, that can come up, that can cause a lot of tension because villains traditionally do bad things. That's kind of what makes them villains, uh, assuming you're not flipping the script and you don't have a villainous group of paladins. But, I mean, think about the scale of bad guys. There's, uh, you know, Yosemite Sam on one end, and what threat does he pose? Well, mostly he just kind of shoots in the air and curses a lot. Actually, is Bugs Bunny actually the villain in that one? Yes. Hmm. But again, neither one of them are gonna knife each other. And then you have like Game of Thrones on the other end. And not to even suggest that that's the end of the spectrum. Uh, because if, there, if you wanna go worse than Game of Thrones, all you have to do is open a history book or in some cases a newspaper. And not every player is going to be comfortable with the kinds of villainous acts that you might consider like, oh, I wanna make this villain like a really, I wanna show that this villain is super terrible so they're gonna do terrible, terrible things. Not everybody shows up to a role-playing game thinking, all right, let's see how bad people can be. Let's see, I just, I've had such a great week, I can't wait for everything to be the worst of everything. I want, a, I want a game where I can just have nightmares. But also be awake. I want a nightmare, waking nightmare. <laughs> uh, some people do. And certainly, you can you know, go with that. But know your audience. And this is especially triple, quadruple, uh, to the nth degree true if you are gaming with people who are of a younger age than you. Uh, make sure that they are on board with the level of villainy that is appropriate. I do this with everybody, um, but I am especially sure with kids, and uh, I've, I've run games for, you know, after school programs, that sort of stuff, um, and I will often uh, 
and the, the question I also have to ask myself is what level of villainy am I comfortable describing? Because I have often worked with teenagers who are like, oh, it's okay. I mean, I've watched Saw like 50 times. And I'm like, that's awful. Um, I don't know who let you do that because not only is that super gory, it's a terrible movie. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, and I'm like, okay, so you're comfortable with like beheadings and gore and violence, um, but that person, uh, but one, I'm not necessarily comfortable describing that to a 14 year old. So guess what? I'm not gonna do that. Um, and we're gonna have that conversation before we get into the game itself. So very much know your audience, know your audience's limits, know your own limits, and make sure that you're comfortable with what you're describing. Um, also remember that not all levels of villainy are equal. Um, there's no really like polite way to say this, but sexual assault is a pretty villainous act, and some people are way more comfortable with like heads coming off and like blood shooting out of the eyeballs or whatever than they are with the idea of a character that performs sexual assault. So remember there are different types of villainy, and that's all part of the conversation. Thanks for bringing the room down, Mike. No problem. <laughs> gotta be responsible, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you just gotta, you gotta say the stuff. So, let's talk more about villains uh, in a more broad spec, uh, sense, in, in a character sense. Villains need to have a motivation. It takes a lot of energy to get up in the morning and build a death ray for 12 hours. <laughs> and then, at the end of all of that, face down some clowns in spandex lose, and then try it again. <laughs> I barely have enough energy to get out of the bed in the morning and turn on the coffee maker. And that coffee maker doesn't blow up any cities yet. So you need to have motivation. Revenge is a classic motivator for villains. In fact, often, we, I'm sure everyone here can remember a single villain who wouldn't shut up about their revenge. Oh, I'm gonna get back at whoever. I'm gonna get back at you know, the, this person. I'm gonna get back at society. I'm gonna get back at the tri-state area. Um, <laughs> now, I'm gonna get back at my brother. Uh, <laughs> revenge is a very strong motivator. It is also a very accessible motivator for many of us. Probably all of us. Um, even the best of us, I'm sure, can kind of at least access the idea of like, oh, if only I had a way to get back at this person who did this lousy thing to me that time. It's a strong thing to, to latch onto, and it's a very easy way to think like, okay, well, suppose I remembered that bully who bullied me in high school, but like, what would happen if now I had laser vision? Yeah, I might find him on Facebook again. No, 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 that would be irresponsible. But if I had a little less self-control, speaking of revenge, there is the less specific chip on the shoulder. This is the idea like, ah, oh, life just gave me a raw deal, and guess what? I'm making that deal raw and turning it around. Or, you know, oh, everybody, you know, used to put me down, but now I drank the super serum, and guess who's, you know, who's the small guy now? Uh, the chip on the shoulder is a very strong motivation. It is also, again, perhaps very accessible if you've ever had a bad day or felt like uh, maybe life didn't treat you as nicely as it could have. Uh, but the chip on the shoulder is a nice motivation because it is indistinct. Revenge ultimately kind of uh, is, ultimately tends to end when the revenge is gotten. And so as long as the villain doesn't get that revenge, it can continue. But, you know, if, I, if, I'm, if I've sworn revenge on, I don't know, the, the mayor because he... Uh, threw me out of my cushy legislature job and now I had to become a supervillain because that's how things go. Um, once I've taken out the mayor or disgraced him or whatever it is, well, my revenge is over and then I'm just kind of like, well, I guess I'll sell this laser on eBay. Like, I don't know. But a chip on the shoulder never goes away uh, because no matter how strong a person gets, especially once they have that mindset that the world owes them, once they have that mindset, nothing is ever enough. And until you have either everything or you've been defeated. A good example of this, Scar. If you remember Scar from The Lion King, the good one. Um, weren't they the same, Mike? No. No, they weren't. Uh, Scar is a great example of this. Someone who wanted revenge, but mostly it was the chip on the shoulder, the idea that he was passed over. And then at the end, when he actually gets what he wants, he's terrible at it. You know, I don't know how much you guys remember this, uh, but apparently I do quite well. 
Um, but yeah, once he has this, the, his hyena goons take over and he's in charge of the Pride Lands, uh, everything's dying, everything's out of balance, he's ruling very poorly. He doesn't even have answers to questions. They're like, "Where you know, the water hole is all dried up, what do we do? And he's like, oh, go do a thing. And he's like, wasn't this supposed to be what you were planning your whole life around? No, he was planning his whole life around getting it and then had no idea what to do with it when he had it just because he had the chip on his shoulder. So. Moving along to uh, things we could all use a little more of, uh, money is a classic, uh, classic motivation. In fact, many of your low tier villains, this is their primary goal. They're not really looking to control the world or the tri-state area, they just need cash. Um, I don't know, this, okay, this might be a little obscure, but I'm at MAGFest, so maybe it's not. Uh, but the ultimate line of Marvel Comics, uh, when they did the Ultimate Series, uh, Spider-Man, and specifically the Shocker. He showed up in about six comics, and in every one, he was defeated in four panels because Spider-Man just showed up, just webbed him to a wall, and that was it. It even got to, it was kind of like a running joke. Like, the Shocker would show up, he's like in the middle of robbing a bank, Spider-Man happened to be nearby, and he's like, oh, come on. Uh, but all he really needed was some cash. Cash is a very strong motivator. However, I feel I should point out, there are two things that money really represents. One of them is the next one, which is power. Sometimes uh, villains are looking for the money, but what they're really looking for is to buy that power. But money can be a good motivator because one, it's very logical. I mean, the money makes the world go around. But if you take the money and really kind of trace it back, a lot of villains don't need the money for anything more than what we all need it for. They need it for food and clothing and housing. Maybe they have a family that's you know, on hard times or something like that. And if you're looking to make a villain more sympathetic, well, you know, it's, not, it's easy not to have sympathy for a bunch of bank robbers who are robbing banks, but then when you find out that they need the money because they've, their mom's got hospital bills, uh, then, gee, okay, well, what is the heroic thing to do there? Is the heroic thing to help the villain? I mean, the bank money is insured, right? No, nah, no. But as we'll kind of get into this, the motivations, the more layered they become, the more complex these issues can be. Uh, misguided altruism is a fun motivator and one that gets very complex for heroes because I don't know if you've ever had someone try to help you, but everything they do to help just hinders you. But how do you complain? They're only trying to help you, right? So misguided altruism on a low level could be someone who's kind of doing their own hero thing, but in a different way. Consider the Punisher. Is the Punisher a villain? No, Mike, he's an anti-hero. It's on Wikipedia. Okay, yes, he's an anti-hero, but depending on your perspective, he's a villain, even though he's trying to take out the bad guys, but he's trying to take out the bad guys in a way that undoes what a hero, what a lawful hero would be fighting for. Um, so that can create some interesting parallels where uh, you now have heroes who have to face kind of a darker version of themselves or even maybe just a less competent version of themselves. Maybe the person isn't a villain because they're trying to do things like the, I gotta cut through the red tape. Maybe they're just bad at what they do. Maybe they are just bumbling and dangerous. Um, Batmite come, springs to mind actually as kind of a, what's that? Leapfrog. Leapfrog. I don't know who Leapfrog is. Isn't Leapfrog a teaching tool? An obscure Marvel villain, the Leapfrog. I'll wiki that later. <laughs> but <gasps> Thanos and the Snap. That is kind of that's so that's like the alternate version of of the misguided altruism, who's like a hero who's just bad at it or is is more dangerous. But the idea that ultimately, um, yeah, Thanos with the Snap, his goal was purportedly to help people. Yes. Of what? Randy the Cowboy from Cowboy Bebop. Yes. Oh, oh God. Right. Okay. Yeah, Randy the Cowboy from Cowboy Bebop, a series I love. Yes, Andy. Andy the Cowboy. He was just terrible. Yeah, he was terrible at everything he did, and he became a great antagonist to Spike, who was, of course, great at everything he did, generally speaking. Um, but yes, but going back to the idea of Thanos, uh, the misguided altruism, like technically, according to Thanos, what he wanted to do was help people. He just wanted to provide resources for everyone. Why couldn't you just make more resources? Well, okay, we obviously see that he's not all there. Um, but yeah, the villain who's like, you know, the world is a mess and I just need to rule it, which I see people nodding. Uh, yeah, that's of course, what's that? 
Ray al Ghul is a great example. Um, I was quoting, uh, oh geez, you said, Dr. Horrible, sorry, you said Ray al Ghul and I totally forgot what I was talking about. I was like, Ray al Ghul is cool. Um, Dr. Horrible, yeah, the world is a mess and I just need to rule it because he feels that everything that's in place for law is in the way, so he needs to circumvent that. Yes, in the back. I, oh, I'm sorry, I, say that again. My Hero Academia fans, I, I haven't seen My Hero Academia yet. Oh. Right, the sort of the accidental villain. You know, it's not really uh, an aspect of the personality or even their fault, it's just something that happens, um, which is also why I have and more. All right, moving along. Villains must pose a credible threat. Threats come in many different, way, uh, many different forms, and some of these, of course, overlap each other. Uh, the most obvious is physical threat. There is, look, sometimes the big hulking monster that fell from the sky poses a pretty obvious credible threat. The dragon that breathes fire and eats people, yeah, credible threat. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the other ones are sometimes uh, less obvious and sometimes underused. Military threats are very powerful. Um, this is where you might have someone who represents not a lot of power in and of themselves, but that they command a military that is effectively stronger than the group that they have. Um, Silver Sable leaps to mind as she can, uh, is one of the leaders of a significant mercenary company. Silver Sable, Mike, geez, what the heck? Uh, hey, I don't know. Um, but uh, you know, even something as simple as like a country poses a strong military threat. Uh, hey, if you do things that this country doesn't like, then they may declare war on you. Careful, Mike, you're getting awfully close to real life. Economic. Economic threats are always fun because people rarely see them coming. Uh, but like I said, money makes the world go round, so if you have a villain who has a very strong buying power, then that can easily turn people around on the villains. Consider Lex Luthor. Especially Lex Luthor, not of the movies where he goes bananas, but Lex Luthor of especially the um, Justice League animated series, which in my opinion is the best Lex Luthor. Uh, yeah, his, you know, why is he so powerful? I don't know, maybe it's because he controls a multinational conglomerate and then owns enough money to successfully run for president. I mean, how much better, how much more of an antagonist to Superman do you get than the literal president of the United States being Lex Luthor? Uh, which does combine, by the way, the political because economic and political do kind of go hand in hand. Careful, Mike, again, a little close to those newspapers. Um, but yes, economic, consider someone who can just buy advertising space and say, these heroes are losers. And that's powerful. Uh, popular opinion is very difficult, and if you're playing like a superhero campaign, uh, J. Jonah Jameson and Spider-Man. How much easier would Spider-Man's life be without J. Jonah Jameson constantly harassing him? It'd be as easy as those two Spider-Man movies that came out, but probably not the next one. <laughs> oh, you've been to the theaters. Um, and uh, one time I was playing a game, and uh, the the heroes had and uh, had come up against a crime boss, and the crime boss had a lot of physical power, a lot of military power in the form of like gangs, but what he ended up doing was just buying out the heroes. He just bought where their homes were, and he bought, <laughs> he bought the rights to all of their stuff, and he created a smear campaign, and the whole city hated them, and they, they were like, what happened? I thought we were like the good guys, and everyone's like, yeah, you're the reason our taxes are high, and they're like, <laughs> what? It doesn't even make sense. Why doesn't my key work? <laughs> Evicted, is that a level three spell? <laughs> uh, political threats, of course, very significant. Uh, Dr. Doom poses an interesting political threat in addition to every other one. Uh, but he's a strong political threat. How many times were the Fantastic Four like, okay, we know where Dr. Doom is. We know how to stop him. We know he's got a super death ray that's going to turn the planet inside out and make everybody into Pop-Tarts. But he's currently in his embassy, so we can't do anything. <laughs> at all. We know where he is, and if he steps foot off that embassy, ooh. 
Okay, here's what we're going to do. We are going to play baseball across the street, and then when we accidentally hit the ball through his window, I think that was an actual plot of the Fantastic Four. <laughs> Things got weird. All right, ideological threats. These are tricky because they do require kind of like some, some work on both the player side and the DM side, but ideological threats are very powerful because they cause questions about what the characters even stand for. Uh, consider Superman and Batman. They are not traditionally villains of each other, but both of them are actually ideological threats to the other. Um, because Superman won't do the what he considers to be the wrong thing under any circumstance, whereas Batman has such a loose concept, like he's like, this is the right thing, everything else is entirely acceptable. And their counterparts also show that. Uh, Lex Luthor, his concept of the right thing is whatever is best to protect humanity, and specifically Lex Luthor. Uh, whereas Superman will sacrifice himself constantly, Lex Luthor will constantly sacrifice others. And so that is an ideological threat because there are times where Lex Luthor is far more effective because he is willing to do anything, and Superman is much less effective because he is not willing to do anything. Vice versa, uh, or vice versa, no. On the other side of the field, Batman uh, will do anything except one thing, which is kill humans. Um, although I gotta tell you, sometimes he, it's a little questionable there. I didn't specifically kill you, but I did break both of your legs <laughs> in this volcano, <laughs> which is actively erupting. But I'm pretty sure you can save yourself. Bye. Um, and then his villain being, you know, his arch nemesis, of course, being the Joker, who says, well, why even hold on to that one thing? Because it's so easy to just let that go, and then you can solve all of your problems. And, from the, and so the Joker tries to show again and again, depending on which version of Batman you're watching, um, how just doing whatever it is that you feel is necessary to do to accomplish your goals. He's like, I get this stuff done all the time. You're constantly fighting, bouncing up against this wall, specifically me. So these ideological threats are great because they allow for keen opportunities for character development, which I'm all about. Uh, both character development for the player characters and also for the villains themselves. And the more character you can build into your villain, the more villainous they become. The more people hate to love them but love to hate them, which is the goal, right? All right. By the way, if anybody has any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand or shout them out or whatever. Uh, a villain needs a personal modus operandi, which is not just fun to say, but it's what marks them as being not just another lieutenant, not just another goon, not just another foot soldier, uh, but that thing that makes them just a little bit different and especially nice if there's something that is immediately recognizable about them. Um, I, for, I ran a long-running campaign, and there was uh, back in years ago, and the one of the recurring villains um, he ha he wore gray robes, and it was a D and D campaign. So like gray robes, like every third magic user wears gray robes. Like no, what's the big deal? Well, normally you know you don't bother to mention the robes, but he just. When I first started running the character, he, his only real dis discerning physical characteristic was that he looked like kind of an old guy with white hair and he had gray robes. Um, and in fact, his name was Slate. So Slate, gray, gray. This shows the level of incredible um, ingenious that I occasionally display. <laughs> I, <laughs> I appreciate the magnificent uh, hand motion. Yeah, I, okay, not all of my villains are top tier. Um, but what happened was <laughs> this villain became um, since, uh, since being an old man in gray robes was kind of like his one defining phys uh, uh, visible trait before the, you know, the necromancy came up and undead and so forth, um, anytime someone in gray robes showed up, everyone would just was like, oh, God, again? And I was like, yep, it's him. Uh, but that's all I had to say. An old man with gray robes comes out of the shadows, and everyone's like, ah, oh, didn't we kill him? Yes. Yes, you did. He's a necromancer. <laughs> he was killed three times. <laughs> he had a lot of foresight. <laughs> uh, uh, so personal MO. Sometimes that, that modus operandi might just actually just be the perspective from which they work, the attitudes that they take towards their villainy, which ties in hand in hand with their um, with their purpose, with their intentions. Uh, maybe it's 
uh, actually, let's go ahead and use the Joker as an example because the Joker's actually gone through a series of different iterations and a series of different perspectives and both of them work pretty well. If you remember the best Batman, the animated series, very good. Um, he, that was a great version of Gangster Joker. He was kind of the mob leader, but in, in only in so much as it affected him personally, and he was mostly just kind of into getting money, getting fame, and being on television, which was always a chance for him to shine. Um, but he always had that particular perspective where what he was looking to do was to activate some kind of a joke. Sometimes it was a lousy pun, sometimes it was some intricate uh, you know, clever joke, uh, depending on who was writing the episode. Um, or consider the other best, in my opinion, Batman, which was from the movie Batman in the, from the 80s, uh, featuring Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton wasn't the Joker in that one. Uh, that was, uh, oh, Jack Nicholson, thank you, man. Sorry, I got a lot going on. <laughs> no, I don't. It's like a wind tunnel up here. Jack Nicholson as the Joker, definitely the involved with series of crime bosses, but when he becomes the Joker, his perspective shifts to artistry. And if you watch the movie, all of the things that he does aren't really about jokes. They're about changing points of view and doing that through art, whatever he considered to be art. In fact, you might not even remember this, but he even had uh, a female sidekick that was definitely not Harley Quinn, but someone that he had scarred uh, permanently to make them like a, a performance piece of artwork. Uh, and even the last part where he was using the, um, uh, the parade to gas everybody, that was supposed to be an artistic demonstration. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have the Heath Ledger Joker, uh, who was all about social change or recognizing the reality of human nature, and that was the perspective that drove him. And so all of his villainous actions were about showing that stuff. So perspective can be a very powerful modus operandi. Um, Power set. Sometimes it's just the powers that they use. Maybe the villains, uh, the Shocker is a great example because in addition to being occasionally a powerful but often a laughable villain, um, his power is that he shocks people. I mean, that's not great, but it's very recognizable. Um, it could be Doc Ock. Doc Ock, hey, a guy walking around with four uh, mechanical limbs who does super science. That's a pretty recognizable power set. Uh, Venom, again, very recognizable, a very nice mirror to Spider-Man's own powers, uh, depending on which version you're watching. Um, I feel like I should do some examples that are not from Marvel, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I just did a bunch of Joker ones. Come on, that's DC. Uh, coincidentally, this is a, I realize I mentioned a bunch of supervillains here. I should talk about characters that are not supervillains, uh, but rather villains from other settings. Consider uh, Vampire. The Masquerade, where sometimes what defines the villain is their power set uh, because they have particular powers, maybe ones that are rare or maybe ones that they use in very unusual fashions. Um, I recently had a vampire game where one of the major villains was a very powerful vampire whose clothing was actually kind of a part of himself. He was a, I'll always mispronounce this, Shimize, um, but he had kind of flesh crafted. Tsumishi? Tsumishi? It's one of those. So it's one of those flesh-crafting vampires uh, from Romagna, uh, but he, his clothing itself was actually a part of him, and so it was able to, his cloak was able to react and move. Um, sometimes that personal MO comes across in just quirks. Sticking with Vampire, I'm running another vampire game where one of the major um, pseudo-antagonists is, uh, is a 12-year-old child. But as a vampire, of course, he's much older than 12 years old, and he has kind of like a Damien Omen vibe going on. And he has yet to use any demonstrable powers of any kind, but everyone, all of the NPCs all act scared of him, and all of the players have picked up on like this weird vibe that he has, and they don't like him either. He hasn't done any powers, like he hasn't, all, like, but he's also in charge. He's the prince of the city. Everyone does whatever he says, and even if they don't want to do it, they tell him that they're going to do it, and then they don't do it secretly in a way that he'll never find out. They're all scared of him, and then the, that makes the players latch on to that fear, and he barely says anything. He just, very simple sentences. You will do this. Okay. That's it. And with that comes this strong sense of someone, like, is he just so powerful that he doesn't need to do anything? Like, so powerful he doesn't even need to show it? Does he not have any powers? 
Is his power so strong that nobody knows that he has powers? <laughs> what is his deal? Uh, and so that quirk can be very compelling. And of course, style. Sometimes just having that slick style makes villains just so villainy. And it might not be necessarily a really cool style. I noticed, by the way, in, during the last description, somebody went like this to demonstrate the Dr. Evil thing. Dr. Evil has a very definite style, bringing that kind of 50s era like hyper villainy to a modern age where it just doesn't quite work. But that's still an interesting style. Yes? Megamind. I love Megamind. That movie is underrated. Uh, it could be the top number one movie for five years and it would still be underrated. Um, <laughs> and definitely style. Um, you know, I, you're, you're, you're a villain, but there's nothing super about you. Oh yeah, what's the difference? Presentation. Having that sense of the theatric seems to go hand in hand, especially with supervillains, but it goes nicely with all other kinds. Um, having that sense of, you know what? I am doing what I want to do, and I am not gonna let anybody stop me, that comes with flair. And that can be very theatrical, and sometimes that can actually work against a villain. Because if they start to monologue, or if they feel like they have everything totally in hand, well, that's how the heroes escape, right? That's how Bond got out of every single one of the machines. Style. Okay. So, villains and heroes need a connection. Aww. They just need hugs. So villains and heroes can start with a connection. You can actually build a villain out of your hero's backstories, which is always super handy. Uh, you can even build heroes out of villains' backstories, which is also super handy, but that doesn't always happen. And it especially doesn't happen in games that are not specifically superhero and supervillain driven. Uh, it's harder to do that with like Dungeons and Dragons or even with Vampire in some, way, in some, uh, some ways. But they need to form that connection. Even if they're just a one episode sort of villain, there needs to be that thing that makes the villain connect to the hero and the hero connect to the villain. And it could just be something as simple as personal attacks. You know, how many times has Aunt May been kidnapped, captured, generally threatened? Uh, a lot. Uh, in fact, that's true of basically anyone who knows a hero but does not specifically know that they are a hero. It's uh, not a great deal. But yeah, personal attacks, making it personal. Uh, there's a reason why superheroes often disguise their faces. It's so that, you know, bad guys don't go after their loved ones. Well, what happens when the bad guys go after their loved ones? Uh, it doesn't even have to be on purpose. It could just be that um, that the attacks happened to affect these heroes. By the way, I was, you remember that game that I was running that I said that there was the guy in the gray robes and everyone was like, uh. Here's another trick that happened. He got together with some other villains because that's kind of how the campaign was going. It was getting bigger and bigger. And the heroes were all like at their war room table in this Dungeons and Dragons campaign and they're like, they've got an army moving in. What can you do? All right, well, if we attack the command structure, then we can disable the entire army, but we're gonna have to really bring it. Okay, so you are one of the world's most powerful wizards. You have a pile of magical items. You're the greatest warrior known to man. And in the middle of this, the bad guys teleport in, disenchant half of their stuff, and leave. That basement got loud. <laughs> that was not appreciated. There was some shouting. But wow, did that war council move fast after that. <laughs> oh my god, you'd, you'd have thought they showed up and like insulted them directly to their face and then, I don't know, like showed them... I, you know, I don't even know what I could have done to make them more angry. I really don't. They did work hard for those items. My favorite comment out of once I could hear distinct words was, they can't do that, that's a player trick. <laughs> I said, they get the same spells you do. Like, how did they know where we were? I'm like, scrying is only a fifth level spell. Jeez. Personal attacks, very effective. 
Uh, the former associate. Um, tomorrow I will be doing playing, uh, putting the character back in non-player character, and one of the things I discussed there is dealing with um, uh, here, uh, players, or player characters dealing with non-player characters that are on their side. The former associate is a very strong villain because oftentimes there's already that personal connection, the we trusted you, we, you know, we thought we were friends. The former associate could be anything from a business partner um, to, who is like, you, you, where do you always go all the time? Like, I've had to do all of this stuff and now I'm, I'm coming after you. Uh, it could be something as simple as that torchbearer that nobody remembered and like left to die to the giant spiders and maybe he somehow got away from the giant spiders and found the crown of command. <laughs> and now he's really unhappy at those people who left him for the giant spiders. Chip on the shoulder, revenge. Former associates can be very strong. Again, this can be a great sense of character building, especially if the former associate is someone who's had a very fleshed out relationship uh, with, the, with the heroes before. And escaped again, of course, Nothing builds a connection more like a villain who keeps foiling the heroes at the last moment or, or managing to get away. Uh, it can be very frustrating for the heroes, and so you have to kind of make sure that there's some element of victory, at least occasionally. Um, and I'll certainly go into this more with recurring, uh, building a recurring villain tomorrow. Um, but one thing that I do like here, uh, I was once running a superhero game, and the heroes were fighting Dr. Mortius, an uh, evil guy in power armor who drove uh, an armored bike. It was the 90s. And so, he kept getting away because I had maybe accidentally miscalculated how much armor he should have and maybe he was virtually impenetrable. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't on purpose. i just mad, bad at math. And so he got away like three or four times and the heroes were like, he just keeps getting away. Like we can't even hurt him enough. We show up enough and we can do enough damage to stop his scheme. But like when it comes to fighting him, he like hits us super hard and then we can only hit him hard enough to make him decide to leave. And they were so mad, and I knew that the things were really getting bad, because on the fourth time, he escaped. He ran away, but he didn't get away on his bike. He had to escape through, some, uh, like through the sewer system or something like that, so they stole his bike. <laughs> and that might sound petty, and it is. <laughs> but they were so proud. They took that bike, and they put it in their hall of trophies. The top of their Hall of Trophies, that was their grandest achievement. They're like, we haven't been able to hurt this guy an inch, but we stole his bike, and now he's got to take the bus or something. I don't know. Oh, they were so mad. Later on, I, I, I quietly lowered his armor, and they, they did fine. Yes? Did the bike have any traps on it? No, it didn't have any traps on it. Even if I had written in traps on it at that point, I didn't have the heart. Could you imagine, because that I think would have been a step too far. It's like he got away four times. We've barely done anything. Ah, but we're going to steal this bike. Vroom, boom. <laughs> he wasn't even here. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I can still hear their victory cry. And I'm like, oh, I got to do something. They shouldn't be this happy about petty thievery. All right, villains must be assailable. <laughs> Interesting that this should come right after a demonstration where I accidentally made the villain a little unassailable. So villains must be assailable. They do not have to be necessarily able to be killed. In fact, some villains just might not be able to be killed. That's just the nature of what and who they are. Um, Dracula is a good example of that. Like, in most of the different instances that Dracula shows up, you literally can't kill him. He just shows up again and again. Castlevania specifically. Like, every time you kill him, well, he just comes back because, hey, you got to make another video game, right? Possibly another Netflix special that doesn't come out nearly fast enough. <laughs> uh, but there must be some sense that they are not indomitable. And it might not be immediate. They, you know, certainly a villain can show up and seem just like, oh, how do we defeat anyone who's so powerful? How do we stop something so magnificent and grand? Magnificent might not be the word they use. So, so intimidating. Uh, but there needs to be some idea that something can be done. So there's the idea of the mortal versus the force of nature. Some thing, some creatures or beings that might be considered villains are maybe better described as a force of nature. In the same way that a rock slide or a volcano is very dangerous, antagonistic, problematic. 
you can't fight a volcano. You can't go up to the, oh, you volcano, I'm just going to punch you until you stop. Um, it doesn't work. You can't reason with it. You can't buy it out. Um, but you, all you can really do is mitigate the damage, right? And some villains are like that. Sauron is perhaps a great example of that. Sauron's a very strong force of nature, just creates evil. Or even the ring. Perhaps the ring is an even better example of a force of nature because the ring doesn't really do anything specifically, but it just causes problems. It, all you can do is mitigate the damage, give it to a hobbit, hope things work out. Um, so um, Bizarro is just kind of sprang to mind as an example of a force of nature because he's as strong as Superman. All you can really do is mitigate the damage around him. Dragons for D&D games where the characters are a much lower level than the dragon. Dragons make a great force of nature. All you can do is put out the fires, protect the townspeople as best you can, hope the dragon goes away. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and so there needs to be an assailable quality for villains. Uh, they certainly don't need to be killed. Most villains are, in stories are not killed. They're thrown in jail. They're simply run out of town. Um, their, all of their stuff is broken and they just kind of like vanish to wherever it is that they hang out in the intervening time. Uh, and so it's important also to remember that villains don't need to be killed. And most people, even megalomaniacal villains, will not push things to the point where they have to choose between success or death. Many villains will say, you know what? I'll give it to you this time because I can leave and come back. Um, so catch this uh, soldier and I'll leave while you uh, tend to that. Um, this is why a lot of villains do have backup plans, even ones, uh, even heroes that feel that they are, they claim to be indomitable, but then for some reason there's always like a, a jump belt or like rocket pack or, uh, you know, a teleport scroll or something like that. But villains should have an Achilles heel. Sometimes that Achilles heel is swords to the face. A very common Achilles heel. Um, but the, if you have something that seems like, you know, the standard approach for the heroes doesn't work, there needs to be some way for the heroes to get in. Maybe it's not physical. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe, you know, if you're dealing with a villain who's got a chip on the shoulder and is looking for revenge, maybe what they really want is just validation that they aren't as bad as they are. Or even just the idea that what the terrible things that they're doing, that they really don't have to do them. Um, this kind of sprang to mind, but Harley Quinn might be a good example of a character whose Achilles heel is entirely emotional. Uh, between the fact that pretty much any time she can be manipulated, uh, okay, before the modern Harley Quinn, she could be easily manipulated by telling her what the Joker would or would not uh, find attractive in her. Um, but her, her sense of self is so predicated on the idea that she has to do certain things or that she's stuck doing certain things that just being told that she doesn't have to do them is often a strong way to get her to stop doing them if you can get her to listen. Uh, but some kind of Achilles heel. Sometimes the Achilles heel is, uh, is very much uh, physical, but it's just some sort of magical loophole. Uh, I can be killed by no man. I am no man. Stab. Which actually was pretty easy, right? Just... Again, Achilles heel is right in this area, swords. It is pretty common. All right. So you're like, okay, Mike, we've got all of these ideas. We've, we've got perspective ideas and we've got modus operandi and all this stuff, but where do we get all of these ideas? And especially how do we keep our villains fresh and different? How do we keep from using the same villains all the time? Well, villainous inspiration comes from lots of places. Uh, sometimes just a cool name. One time I was hanging out and I was like, Lord Overkill is an awesome name. I'm going to make a villain called Lord Overkill. Fortunately, at the time, City of Heroes was still on, so I was able to do that. But he did appear in role-playing games after that. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's the cool name. Um, you were like, you know, I don't know. Uh, what was I listening to the other day? Flashette. Somebody used the, term, the word flashette, and I was like, that's a really cool name. And then I looked it up online, and it has, of course, already been used. Um, but I was like, you know what? I might make a flashette character anyway, because that's a cool name. Uh, a devastating power set. Sometimes you're flipping through the rule books, and you're like, huh, you know what would be awesome? I noticed that the, let me see if I can even remember this, uh, the girdle of giant strength and the ring of strength specifically mention that they don't work with any strength enhancing powers except each other. What would happen if I put them both on somebody? 
and then made them evil. And then I did that, and it was fun. Um, so I did that. It basically made us, it kind of made a super villain campaign in my D&D game because he was just this, this guy who was so incredibly powerful. Oh, and then I was like, what if I put it on a mummy? Oh. Yeah, I could tell the D&D players who are all like, oh, that's not right. That's not fair. No, it's not fair. That was wildly unfair. The fight with that guy ended with characters throwing a ring of regeneration at each other. It wasn't fair. <laughs> Neither of them were clerics. Wildly outclassed. Campaign. <laughs> Thanks for coming with me on that brief journey into my past. Um, a campaign based origin. Uh, this is always a great place to get villains from. If you've got a campaign setting, odds are that campaign setting can generate villains in some way on its own. Whether you're taking a look at your D&D uh, setting and you're like, ooh, I can't help but notice that I've got like a dwarven settlement and an elven settlement right next to each other and the player characters are almost all dwarves. So I'm gonna have a real obnoxious elf who wants to expand into that territory. That becomes my new villain. Sure. Um, maybe you've got a setting, maybe you're, you know, if you've got a superhero setting, most of those kind of manufacture supervillains, uh, whether it's toxic goo or insects biting people after being irradiated or just living in a society. Uh, and so you can draw inspiration for your villains directly from your campaign, which is also great because that reinforces the campaign and they tend to fit pretty logically because that's where they came from. Maybe you're like, okay, like, I don't have time for all of this nonsense where I look through rule books. I like to daydream, and the other day I thought it'd be super cool if there was, like, this, this super villain who had, like, trained snakes, and uh, the snakes were, like, able to fly. That would be super cool. And then, like, in a scene with, like, a dark cathedral and a bunch of candles around, that would be awesome. And I'd be like, yes, you should do that. Uh, and maybe you're just like, I have a dramatic scene, and I want that to play out. So, and then from there, you take the dramatic scene and then you work backwards. You're like, okay, how do I integrate this into the campaign? How do I make the character? What power set does the character need to have in order to have flying snakes? Uh, or whatever it is. Uh, and you can work backwards from that. Uh, video games are often kind of built this way and occasionally built too much this way. I'm looking at you, Uncharted. Built entirely out of set pieces. But you can use a set piece for like the thrilling showdown and that's gonna be the thing. Or maybe the thrilling, it's not the thrilling showdown. Maybe you're like, my heroes have been relying on this one power too often, so I want a scene where they use it and then it fails. And then they have to think of something else. And of course, if you are like me, and you like dice, and you really, <laughs> already I've got people in the back, yeah, dice. Um, random generation. Uh, randomly roll up characters, uh, the first edition DM's guide, wow, you're old, Mike, yes, I am, thank you. Uh, the first edition DM's guide has a great set of roll, uh, random rollers in the background, uh, or in the, in the background, in the back of the book. Um, the Dungeons and Dragons second edition villain's handbook, which has the one with the bluish gray blue cover, has amazing randomized charts for making villains, and a lot of other good tips as well. Um, so just randomly generate. I also find that when I try to randomly generate a villain and I find myself saying, nah, I don't want that one, that actually helps me just get rid of ideas that I don't want and make me realize what I do want. I'm like, I'm gonna roll in this random table until I get what I want. I randomly rolled him. What were the odds? <laughs> it's all fair. And other lies GMs tell. Um, so yeah, random generation. Even if just that random generation, you don't go with the whole thing that you've rolled, but rather just that spark, that idea. Oh, I never really thought of combining fire powers and water powers. Oh, what if those did come out of the same person? What is it, an, an ex-priest who's now a mage? Wow, that's an interesting set of spells. All right. With that, I actually, ooh, I actually managed to not only end with time, but enough time for some questions as well, but I will first say thank you very much. I am and remain Captain Mike. Uh, by the way, you may have noticed that I do have my, my email address, Captain Mike at CaptainMike.net. I also have business cards if you need them. Um, if you want to email me uh, with any questions or comments, or if you just want to say, hey, I came up with this cool idea for a villain and you just want to show off, or you just want to say how great I am, uh, you're welcome to 
connects with me there. And I will also briefly mention uh, that I also have, as I said, a number of other presentations, including one in a couple of hours. Um, so here's my quick list. Friday at 7.30 is story arcs and role-playing games. Saturday at 4 p.m. is the sequel to this one, Building a Better Recurring Villain. Saturday is 8.30 p.m., uh, putting the character back in non-player character. But I do have a few minutes if anybody has any questions that they wish to entertain. Or you can just clap for me. That's cool, too. Thank you very much. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Questions, comments, concerns? I'm, I'm so not used to ending on time. <laughs> this is <laughs> How many villains is enough? As many as it takes. Uh, that depends a lot on the, on the scale and scope, I suppose. Uh, all right. Thank you for much. Oh, you do? Sure. Come on up. Uh, okay. I'm going to stop with the microphone, but if you want to come up to ask me any questions or get a business card, feel free to do so.